Hey, thanks, John. Okay. okay, good evening, everybody. Um, back on the 14th, of course, of, the, of this month, uh, this spacecraft, New Horizons, after nine and a half years, finally made it out to Pluto's space. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight basically an overview of the spacecraft. This is a wonderful model. It was donated by one, built and donated by one of our members, uh, Kevin Kilkenny. Uh, this is about one-fifth scale. So it's actually about the size of a grand piano when you think about it. It made it out to that system and flew through. We're going to discuss uh, how, about the vehicle, how Pluto itself was discovered, some of the controversies in that, and we're going to also talk about what we've learned so far. Okay, so I'm going to give a little bit of history over here. Uh, the gentleman on the left over here is William Herschel. He was actually a musician who uh, emigrated from Germany uh, to England in the 18th century, uh, 19th century, 18th to 19th. He got hooked on the, on the astronomy bug real hard, learned how to build telescopes, and it was during a sky survey, just seeing what was out there, mapping where he could find objects and such, he discovered this. This is the planet Uranus. Uh, this discovery was made on March 13, 1781. So if anybody out there is an amateur astronomer, and thinks his little telescope, his little six inch, can't do a lot of really good work, remember William Herschel. However, it looked like the planet Uranus was straying from the path that it was calculated to follow. This gentleman over here, Jean-Joseph Leverrier, and others determined the location of what they thought was a new planet. This is a map basically showing where Leverrier predicted it, where another gentleman, John Cooch Adams, believed it would be in England, but in the actual location here. So Leverrier came very, very close to the actual position. This is all a triumph of mathematics. Neptune, this planet here, photographed by the Voyager uh, 2 spacecraft back in 1989, was first observed September 23rd of 1846 by Johann Galle in uh, the Berlin Observatory, thanks in part to the calculations of this gentleman and new sky charts, because at the time they were trying to look for new planets, but they were looking for what today we call asteroids. Okay, then Neptune seemed to be straying in its orbit. This gentleman, Percival Lowell, was a wealthy Bostonian. He'd established an observatory near Flagstaff, Arizona, which is still there, the Lowell Observatory. Ostensibly, he was going to be looking at Mars. But then he got caught up in the excitement of the possibility of searching for <clears throat> Planet X. You ever notice that in science, we always have an X being unknown? Well, there it is. This gentleman um, believed very much that Mars was inhabited and that the heroic but dying Martians were built, digging canals to bring water from the poles down to the parched equator. Wonderful imagination. I'm afraid it didn't quite work out that way. Someday I'll have to talk about Mars and this gentleman. However, his observatory outlived him and a gentleman, young gentleman over here, Clyde Tombow, came, was, came to be hired there. He was born in Illinois in 1906. He was raised in Kansas. And he found himself wanting to have a better telescope than he had, uh, but couldn't buy one. He kind of reminds me of me and a lot of other amateur telescope makers because, quite frankly, we can't afford multi-thousand dollar instruments. So he learned, like I did and others, the art of optical and instrument building, and he built this 9-inch uh, Newtonian. Uh, he just wanted to see how good his equipment was, so he was a bit bold on this. He sent copies of his drawings of Mars and Jupiter to Lowell Observatory in 1929. And this is from his notebook. And I looked at these pictures, and let's see, it's 1928, so that means uh, my drawings were about 40, 46, 47 years later. It looks an awful lot like them. This is very much what the visual appearance of Jupiter looks like even today. Now, here's how he did it, as they say. Quote, I was interested in telescopes and the way they worked because I had an intense desire to see what things look like. So I learned how to use telescopes and find things in the sky. Now, how do you do observations at a telescope? This is it. This is perfect. See, what you do is you have a drawing board and a pencil in hand at the telescope. You look in, you make some markings on the paper, and you look in again. Very basic, very fundamental, and he's right. Okay. Now, this gentleman was the director at the time, Vester Sliffer. Uh, he reasoned from seeing these drawings that he had a good eye for detail, and the fact that he had built from, cobbled together from components he found uh, a, uh, two axes for the telescope to move on. One was from his father's Ford truck. It was good for anything else, apparently, except for a 
axis on a telescope, and the other one came out of a uh, milking machine. Put them together, put the telescope there, so he figured he had the perseverance and the skills to take on this task of searching for a new planet. It's quite a jump when you think about it to go from that home, home built instrument over here to this. this. If anyone's familiar with uh, telescopes and telescope making, they'll recognize the name the Clark Optical Company of Cambridge Port. Back in the 19th century into the early 20th century, uh, they built repeatedly the largest refractor telescopes in the world. The largest one, of course, being the 40 inch Yerkes refractor lens telescope. After they passed away, a gentleman by the name of Carl Lundin Sr. took over the company. They manufactured the Cook Triplet, a three element system which was used for photography. And by the way, this observatory, this part of that observatory is still there. You can go out there and visit the Pluto telescope, as it's called. Now, you see, this gives you a large flat field on a photographic plate. Yes, yeah, glass plates. This is not CCD, folks and most certainly is not standard film. But it's a very demanding optical system to build. That center element was ground almost too thin. There was no easy replacement. Lundin approved, tested and approved the completion. Now the problem here is that now when you focus this instrument, you have to be very, very careful. It's a very difficult piece of equipment to work with when it's not made properly. But in a sense, that helped in the discovery of Pluto because you had to be that careful to focus and in doing so you'll get the fainter stars. Maybe there was a fortunate uh, bit of luck there. But the bad part of this of course, $10,000 was donated by uh, Percival Lowell's older brother uh, to this. 6000 went into the lenses. So, you know, it's called going way over budget if you're not careful. But these gentlemen made that work. These are the craftsmen that helped build that instrument. That's Ed Mills, on the left and Stan Sykes on the right. They built the mount and the optical tube assembly. They did a beautiful job of it too. Again, everything had to be exactly right, precise, and these gentlemen hit it right on the mark. Now, this is something that, uh, when I've mentioned how this thing works, this is called a blink comparator. It's a microscope, but it's designed in such a way that you have a flip mirror. You look at one plate first, then the next one, back, forth, back, forth, looking for this little dot, or dots in some cases, if you have a bunch of asteroids in the field, that will seem to shift. It's kind of the same effect that if you put, your, you put out your thumb and you blink your eyes back and forth, you'll see this perspective where your thumb will seem to move back and forth. You know it's not moving. But it's that illusion that allows you to be able to see if anything is on a photographic plate. And it turns out that a lot of discoveries were made with this, uh, Carl Polfrish. <laughs> I, when I was doing the research for this talk, I was really, really surprised to find out there was a gentleman that actually designed this, not just a whole group of people like you usually find in many corporations. And he was working in Zeiss. Back then that was considered, and to the extent today still is close, to the premier optical company. In 1904, he had no idea how many important discoveries would be made with this invention. It's not just the discovery of Pluto. That's the big one for us here tonight. But there was another use for this. Two photographic plates, one taken in March, one taken in April, of a galaxy, for example, in the southern sky. A young woman, uh, Henry, uh, Henrietta Leavitt, looked at these and looked for stars that were varying in light. Once you know this particular type of star, what's called a Cepheid variable, basically every four or five hundred days or more it actually pulses, it gets brighter, expands out, and then collapses. Once you're able to tell its exact real brightness, you have a standard candle and you can tell the distance to that star and therefore the galaxy. That discovery was made with an instrument like this. It turns out that you could go back and forth very quickly with photographs, but think of this as a flip book. When you had those when you were a kid, and you kind of flip uh, a move, what appeared to be a moving picture going back and forth. But here you got 14 by 17 inch pages. Okay, it was a pretty rough task. These are the actual discovery plates that were taken on January 23rd on the left and January 29th on the right, 1930. And here is Pluto here. And here's Pluto over here. Imagine trying to find this itty bitty little dot. But because Clyde, uh, Clyde Tombaugh had the persistence to keep on with the task, he was able to do it. Okay. 
but where to look? You have the entire sky to work with. We had a rough idea. It had to be in the path of the planets, we thought. But to get an exact bead, uh, this young woman here, Elizabeth Williams, led a group of what they call computers. Back then, there was basically undergrads and a few graduate students in math. They were computers. And they would sit there and they'd do the calculations to try to determine where to look for this particular planet, or any planet for that matter. And again, success. The arrow points to Pluto over a period of uh, six days. As you can see, it jumps back and forth. This is the announcement from Lowell Observatory. The discovery of a solar system body apparently trans-Neptunian, in other words, beyond Neptune. And then, of course, uh, the work through here, you, I've read through this. It's wonderful. It's terrific. It's exactly correct astronomically. Then the New York Times picked up on it, and that's exactly how people in New York, and for that matter, around the world, eventually found it out, translating it into plain English that they found another planet. Okay. Now, once you get a new object, most of the time you wanted to want to give it a name. Uh, astronomy actually is, is defined as the science of studying the heavens. Okay? When you break it down, it actually means the naming of objects in the sky. It's where we get uh, the root word where we get a nomenclature from or naming. This young lady over here, this is 11-year-old Venetia Burney. Her uncle suggested Pluto. Submit that for the Roman god of the dark underworld would be a good name. Uh, she was born in Britain. Her selection was adopted by December of 1930. Now, uh, this is when I get to the Disney part of this. Okay, how many people think that the pup came first? That Pluto the dog came first? Okay, a couple hands, a couple hands. How many people think the planet came first? That's right. The planet came first. Here we go. Yeah, and uh, in honor of the newly discovered planet and the excitement, Walt Disney decided to take the dog of that you see here that originally was called Rover, very common name, and they called him Pluto. And the rest is history. Okay. Now, Dr. Tom Bell himself retired in 1973, had a long career. Uh, he uh, continued to observe and to lecture, raising money toward the end of his life for various educational projects. I met him at Stella Fane, which is the uh, place where telescope makers get together. This year is the 80th uh, ye meeting of that convention. And in 1988, he signed uh, Pluto posters, including myself, for myself as well. And for an admiring crowd, uh, crowd he passed away age 90 in 1997. His wife, Patricia, or Patsy, I also met her too there. She passed away in 2012. She was 99 years old, bless her. She really hoped to see New Horizons reach that discovery of her husband. And she had been quite upset by the International Astronomical Union's demotion of Pluto to a Kuiper Belt status. Uh, the <laughs> uh, at this point, some people might be saying, "Okay, why was it demoted?" Well, the unofficial, the official reason is that the definition by the IAU that they came up with just didn't fit Pluto. It was supposed to be a round object, a spheroidal body. It was on orbit around a star, and it cleared its orbit of all debris. By that definition, ladies and gentlemen, you are not standing on a planet. Earth has never cleared its own path around the sun. Jupiter hasn't. None of the planets have, because we still have meteors come in. But the definition so far since 2006 has stood. Uh, it has been question quite a bit as we've been finding exoplanets, planets going around other stars. And we don't know if they've, they've cleared their orbits either. So, you know, it's kind of a dumb uh, way of doing it. And she rightly was very disappointed by this, by that demotion. And here he is at Stella Fane. This is not my photograph. That's not my telescope. I wish it were. I would have had him autograph it. Uh, that instrument belongs to another gentleman I met on the web on oh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And he was there, and uh, he sees this elderly gentleman by his telescope, and he says, yes, sir, can I help you? He turns around, he sees who it is. And Dr. Tombow says, is this your instrument, young man? And he stammers, out, yeah, yes, it is. I built that myself. Oh, lovely. I love the mount. The tel telescope tube is great. How good? Did you make the optics? Yes, I did. Oh, very good. Excellent. Wonderful telescope. Good to meet you, young man. Walks away. The guy's like, duh. <laughs> I mean, this guy discovered a planet, for God's sake. But he also, as I mentioned before, he was a telescope maker, so he kind of knew where he was coming from on this. 
1933, he built this, what was called a richest, rich or richest field telescope, the first one apparently built in the United States. Today we would call them Dobsonian telescopes because they have a very short focal length. They're made relatively simply, but, but they work quite well. They give you a big field of view, more or less, compared to some standard instruments. That must have been something else. Well, why couldn't it have been my telescope he was by? Okay, now here's a signpost up ahead, as they say. Uh, this is uh, in Burdett, the boyhood home of Clyde Tombaugh. You can go to see this plaque in Kansas. And it mentions much of his work, including the fact that he had photographed after discovering Pluto more than 65% of the sky, 7,000 hours, examining 90 million star images, looking for more objects, not necessarily another Pluto. He found six star clusters, a cloud of galaxies, a comet, and over 775 asteroids, rocks basically just flying through the solar system. So basically, he had seen so much in such incredible detail, no one's ever equaled it. Okay, and this is a fitting memorial. Uh, his wife, uh, Patricia, had, Patsy, had uh, helped to found in 1954 the Unitarian Universalist Church in Las Cruces. This is a 10-panel stained glass window. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that uh, memorializes not just his discovery of Pluto, but the fact he was a telescope maker, that he worked in early rocketry, and basically inspired young people to go into uh, the sciences. Excuse me. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. So, so far, at least as we think we know, the composition and structure, some of this has, has been confirmed, by the way. Uh, the atmospheric composition is methane and nitrogen. We're not sure whether it has a magnetic field, but because it's so small and because it slowly rotates, it takes six Earth days to go once on its axis may have no magnetic field at all. We're not sure, though. It appears to be about 70% rock, 30% water ice, and its mass is about 22 ten thousandths that of Earth. So if you weigh 100 pounds here on Pluto, if you weigh about 2 or 3 ounces, it's a lot. So it's a good way to lose weight real fast. Okay. Internal structure may have a rocky core with a mantle of water ice, more exotic materials like methane and nitrogen frost coating the surface. And it turns out much of this, by the way, is confirmed. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Here's some more information. That's the average distance from the sun. Look at that. 3.67 billion miles from the sun on average. It's 0.75 billion miles away. And when it hits aphelion or furthest away from the sun, look at that distance. 4.58 billion miles out. 48 times and more that of Earth from the sun. The temperature on a summer day there is a balmy minus. 420 degrees below zero. It's extremely cold. We know uh, so far, at least the data has told us this, at the moment, it knows at least five moons. We know about Charon. We knew about it since 1978. And it's about half the diameter, by the way, of Pluto. But then we have Styx, Nix, Keberos, and Hydra, all related to the fact that Pluto was a god of the underworld, in, in this case in Roman mythology. And by the way, uh, although the surface that you're seeing over here, this is just speculation in this particular slide, Kerberos, the colors are just about right. Kerberos is very dark, and we're wondering whether or not these pieces of moons, these fragments, may have actually been from a collision with Pluto or even Charon. So to give you an idea of size, Pluto is on the left, Charon on the right, compared to the United States. Okay. But what happened with Neptune? Well, it turns out, after the flyby of Neptune in 89, it was apparent the mass of the planet was underestimated. So when they punched in the correct value, which turns out to be 17.1 times the mass of the Earth, you put in the old equations, there's no error in the path of the planet. We just didn't know it had this kind of mass. Pluto was the largest object that was there, and basically good old-fashioned perseverance and coincidence made it possible to find it. Now, of course, many people are saying, okay, well, that was Pluto. What if there is an Earth-sized world further out? Well, so far, we haven't found it. And our telescopes today can look in the infrared, which allows us to be able to see objects maybe out to maybe 3 billion miles or more of an object that size, maybe even further. So as I say, if we're looking for another object out there about 
where it's supposed to be rather large, stay tuned. Maybe there is something there. Okay. And now enter New Horizons. Uh, as I mentioned before, I love this, this painting. You know, this, is, this is really amazing because it's Pluto in the foreground, Sharon, and all the way in the distance, sunward, 3.6 billion miles is the sun. You and I, our planet, all the inner planets, is lost in the glow here. It's nothing more than an extremely bright star at that distance. Okay, this is an overview of the spacecraft, and we actually have, uh, for your viewing pleasure, a model, as I mentioned before. This is one-fifth scale, and it turns out uh, the antenna, very basic such, the antenna and the dish over here maintaining link with NASA scientists. Also, there's the low-gain and medium-gain uh, antennae up here, and this, in particular, turn this around. This is one experiment which is at the bottom there is mentioned as Rex, the radio, radio science experiment which as it passed behind Pluto looking back at the Earth it sent a, uh, the signal rather was sent from Earth to Pluto through its atmosphere so it would pick it up here and it could also pick up radio signals directly from the planet if any existed. Uh, I love the abbreviations here. Uh, Pepsi which is uh, <laughs> This guy over here, I'll turn that for you. This little guy over here. It measures particles escaping out of Pluto's atmosphere. Next to it is SWAP, which basically is a solar wind at Pluto. Wonderful abbreviations. But the most important instrument, and I think I may have to pick this up to show it properly. I just hope I don't lose the spacecraft in the process. There we go. This is LORI. This is the long range reconnaissance. Uh, instrument. This is the one that gets all the great photographs. It's how many people here have a telescope? First things first. Hands up. Come on. Okay. How many people have an eight-inch aperture telescope? Okay, like a C8 or a Mead. Okay, great. Your instrument is almost exactly what was sent out there, with a couple differences. We'll talk about that later. But the instrument itself is a super camera. All these pictures are being taken by it. Uh, there are other names here that you can see, and I'm going to see if I can turn this around so we can turn them toward you. There are a couple thrusters over here and right through here. Uh, these are not abbreviations. This is Ralph. This is Alice, yes, for the Honeymooners couple because they actually work, well, supposedly like the Honeymooners, uh, they work closely in tandem because uh, Alice probes the atmosphere looking in the ultraviolet and invisible and infrared light Ralph makes maps of Pluto itself, its moons and any other objects in uh, the system. On the back here is a student built named for Venetia Burney dust detector which has been active almost all the way from Jupiter seven years till it got to Pluto's space looking for dust between the planets and letting us know what's happening or had happened as it moves through. There was a very real fear that as this moved at something like 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet through the uh, Pluvian system, that du dust the size of a grain of sand would hit this and smash through the spacecraft. At that speed, a little thing like that could have tore it apart. I'm happy to report, of course, it did not happen. So it was pretty clean all the way up. They did have an idea. If they knew that they were going to be going this way across of uh, the Pluto, Pluto system, they had a partial shield that would just take the radio antenna and basically use it for what is called a Whipple shield, named for, the, for Fred Whipple who came up with this idea. And on top of all this, obviously if you have all this equipment on here, it needs power. This little guy up here. This is a radioactive thermo, thermoelectric generator, an RTG. It is a uh, Galileo uh, surplus. It was left over from building the spacecraft. It put out, it's right now putting out 200 watts of electrical energy, 35 of which, only 35 watts, is used to power the entire spacecraft during its encounter. That's not bad. Uh, many people are, uh, correctly are afraid of the possibility that a, a radioactive generator using plutonium, and of course everybody thinks that they say, oh my god, it's a bomb. No, it's not a bomb. It's the wrong isotope. All that it does is it, all that it does is generate heat because quite literally, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the uh, compound is falling apart at the atomic seams. And the electron, the, actually the neutrons and such are trying to get out of it so fast and so quickly that it heats up. It heats up the metal 
we take that heat, we put it through thermocouples that convert the heat directly to electricity, and you power spacecraft. Now I'm going to see if I can redock this back on here. Ah, here we are. I may need some help from, uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm going to let that this sit back here because I'm a little afraid of damaging a beautiful model. Luckily, it has the docking port over here. There we go. Now, Kevin, member Kevin Kilkenny did a beautiful job on that. I'm jealous of him. He, I, I can barely put two sticks of wood together to build a telescope tube. And he, he did a magnificent job on that. So this is a quick overview of the spacecraft. In the white room, there are no black curtains. However, this is not a mock-up. This is the actual spacecraft that was, it was being put together. Now, you can get an idea of scale. The guys that are back there working on it are roughly six foot tall. So it's a good sized vehicle. This is LORI, as I mentioned before, the reconnaissance imager that studied as it Pluto as it approached its target. And the gentlemen basically are wiring it into place into the spacecraft. It's one heck of a camera. As I mentioned before, if you have a Celestron or Mead Schmidt Cassegrain, this is basically the same type of optical system. We have a corrector plate. We have a primary mirror, a secondary, but here's the difference. It also has a field flattener so that it corrects for what's called curvature of the focal plane so that you can put a flat CCD uh, chip in there and get a perfect image across the field of view. Uh, LORI is probably my favorite instrument personally because it gives us these incredible pictures and you're going to see those in a little bit. Now I mentioned there is one big difference between the telescope you get here and this instrument. These mirrors are not made of glass. M1 and M2 are made of a material, which you've probably heard of, silicon carbide or carborundum, but it's compacted and sintered, pressed together under extreme heat. So it actually operates like a metal. And the beauty of this, instead of using quartz, which could be fragile, that could break under cold conditions, this will not break. And more importantly, it operates perfectly as an optical system. Very, very nice piece of work over here. I'd like to meet the optician who did that work. Okay. This is Rex, the radio science experiment. Basically, it's just a, another dish on the inside here and a circuit board so it could pick up signals from Earth. There's Ralph, the visible color imager and the infrared spectral imager, which allows us to be able to get these wonderful color pictures. Uh, notice how much little power it uses, only about 6.74 watts out like an old night light before they went over to LEDs. And if you have Ralph, you've got to have Alice. This is the UV spectrograph, 3.6 watts. It's not, almost nothing. And allows us to be able to view in the ultraviolet to look into the atmosphere and get its composition. This is Pepsi. The, I love this, the best abbreviation of the whole group. The Pluto Energetic Particle Spectrometer Science Investigation. Using only a tiny bit of current itself it's looking for charged particles that will be thrown out by uh, Pluto's atmosphere or anything else for that matter. And SWAP, even that far away from the sun, the influence of the sun on Pluto can be felt. This is the solar wind at Pluto. That's this instrument on here on the model. Again, just a tiny amount of current. Okay, there's the Venetia Bernie student dust counter. Designed, built, and flight certified by a group of undergraduate and graduate students with NASA's help. It already, as I mentioned before, it told us about interplanetary dust populations past Jupiter, and it has given us a look at near Pluto space and beyond. There was that fear that maybe because whatever created those moons might have left rings or dust clouds or something. This would let us know at least some kind of warning. There was nothing there to be detected, apparently. Either that or it was a very lucky spacecraft. Okay, and as I mentioned before, this is a RTG. It was a space surplus unit up to 200 watts of energy. And after this mission, it will power the spacecraft at least another 20 years. And that's a good thing because so far we've found two Kuiper Belt objects, two other objects beyond Pluto that in, depending on which one we choose to go to, can't get both. I wish you could. In 2018 or 2019, we'll get a close-up look of what we think is where large comets that occasionally go through the inner solar system come from. How many people here remember Comet Hale-Bopp back in 97? Okay, a whole group of us, great. That's perhaps 
where that, that object came from. The comet before, the year before, Comet Yakutake. Anyone? Anybody remember that one? Okay. Yakutake may have been from the Oort cloud, much, much further away, because its orbit was a very narrow, tight one. This will at least give us a look at an object that might someday or may have been a comet. Okay, now also on board, I could not get a picture of the Maryland coin. This is the Florida uh, state coin uh, quarter. It was coated, as you see, coated in gold and mounted aboard the spacecraft. A, an annoying stamp from 1990, Pluto not yet explored. We'll talk about that later. And this, uh, interred here are remains of American Clyde Tombaugh. Well, after all, uh, he passed away in 97, and they decided that maybe it would be kind of appropriate that maybe he, uh, Clyde goes out and takes a good close look at what he had discovered. Yes, there's some ashes in there. So, I think it's very nice. Okay, ready to fly. And this is a takeoff on a comic from the, uh, the far side. <clears throat> a bunch of tough planetary astronomers stood watch on their spacecraft. They're, it's a very nice. And the gentleman in the middle of here is Alan Stern, who is the principal investigator. So he had a right to have his arms crossed. Okay, come on, try something. And a liftoff back in 2006 in an Atlas V, the fastest spacecraft ever put into space. After nine hours at this speed, it cleared the moon's orbit. It reached Jupiter in a year, and its gravity pulled it up to 51,000 miles an hour. That took five years off the travel, but it still had seven more years to reach Pluto. So, I mean, things are very far away over here. This is not Star Trek. You know, we do not have 48 minutes to have a story occur, and you go star to star to star or something. I wish. Oh, boy, do I wish. But I like to think that maybe some of the younger people here in the audience, the children especially, like the ones outside there, maybe one of them will come up with a design for a vehicle that might get us out there a little faster, I hope. Okay, this is an important ritual. I hadn't realized that this ha does occur. But after every successful launch, the failure and assessment guidebook is formally burned. And this is what they did with, no, with New Horizons guidebook. This is the one that uh, basically says, if the vehicle blows up, this is what you do. And I'm still trying to figure out what you do. I'd love to read, love to read a copy of this thing. Okay. So it was a very long trip, as you can see. But we finally made it. Okay. On July 14th of this year, this is basically the trajectory. The various encounters, the closest encounter was at 7.50 a.m. on the 14th. I hope you didn't miss it. Uh, actually, we didn't know about it for another four hours because at the speed of light, that's how long it took the signal that we made it, made it back to Earth. And there were other various other events here. The Pluto Earth occultation, as it's called. The scene from Pluto, Earth was all the way sunward, over three billion miles away. And they were watching to see as the signals from Earth passed through the atmosphere of Pluto to get an idea of the composition of the atmosphere. Then Charon, its largest moon, did the same occultation work a couple hours, about two hours later. Same thing, also looking for an atmosphere and what its composition would be. Okay, so on July 3rd, these are our first color photos. And of course, you know, this is one of these things where uh, you don't quite know what you're looking at yet, but boy, it looks interesting. And we're still looking at these four, three, four large dots, if you will. And then at last, this is one of the best pictures. It was downloaded back on Wednesday of this week. One of the best air photographs here. This is nicknamed, this area here, nicknamed the whale. This area over here was called the heart, because you've got a good imagination. There it is. This now is formally, well, informally. It still hasn't been approved by the same guys that demoted Pluto. Uh, Tombaugh Regio, or Tombaugh Region. So I think it's kind of appropriate. There's, there's a lot of geology through here. It's amazing what we're seeing over here. We don't quite know what we're looking at, but we do know that the surface is very young. Okay, we also found methane ices on Pluto. Imagine natural gas frozen. You need temperatures below 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and by heaven, that's what we got over here. And we're able to see and note that there apparently is methane frost, maybe even snow. Okay, and there's the atmosphere. This is the most recent photo. Looking back sunward, the sun's lighting up the atmosphere. You can see it's a very thin atmosphere. It's only about a 50th that here on Earth. But it's very hazy. So something is giving it that haze. 
because normally nitrogen is almost completely clear and so is methane. So it's haze layers, we're not completely sure. We believe they're about 52 miles above Pluto's surface is where it starts to clear out. So maybe we have clouds here. We're seeing them in profile. So maybe from the ground this is if you stood, if you could stand, on the surface of Pluto. This is what you would see looking back toward the sun and of course Sharon in the background. And it turns out that the solar wind does interact. There's a shock wave that occurs and apparently swap detected ions of nitrogen. It is losing its atmosphere very slowly under the action of the sun. Even that far away, the sun's energies are able to affect it. So apparently it slowed and deflected the solar wind. We may have a magnetic field here. Magnetic fields do this. If it didn't have one, the bow shock you're seeing over here would be very tight and very, very thin. So something happened here. So here's the big picture. It's a mess, as you can see. Solar wind comes in. It's ionizing the atmosphere. Maybe there's a magnetic field which is casting this void area behind the system. We don't know. We're still analyzing the data. And by the way, that data, the photographs and the imagery, all the information is going to be broadcast, unfortunately, very slowly because it's coming down from a long distance away. It's going to take till November of next year to get it all. And that's still something like about, I think it's around four or five terabytes of information. Two or three hard drives worth. Okay. And here we are, the mountains of Pluto that have been re, uh, reoriented by computer. These are 11,000 feet high, folks, made of, we believe, water and other ices. But look at the surrounding area. They're like ice flows. There's nothing there. We think that something remelted this. And maybe as little, I want to call it in geologic terms, as little as 100 million years ago, maybe even less than that. Okay, and just west of Tambal Regio, more of the mountains. We're still not quite sure what caused these troughs here, too. But notice there are almost no craters. Usually you have an old surface, you have lots of craters. Things get swept up and get and hit. There's almost nothing there. I mean, what appears to be a crater over here looks more like a broken mountain. The ice fields of Pluto, this is, again, seems to be evidence that whatever water and other ices are here were melted and then cooled very quickly. There's about 20, 25 miles across. And this is, area has been officially named Sputnik Planum, or the Traveler's Plane. Yes, for the spacecraft back in 1957 that the uh, Soviets first launched into orbit around Earth. So part of, the red, part of this is to name it for explorers and spacecraft of exploration, hence. Okay. So here's an overview. It's, there's a lot of areas through here. They think there's a thin ice sheet. That area called, nicknamed the whale has been called Thulu Regio. So, you know, again, uh, creatures of the dark and everything. Uh, Hillary, for, not for uh, Hillary Clinton, but uh, for an explorer of the mountains. The polygons are up here. Really wild areas there, and there is one crater we can confirm as a crater, but it's been filled with ice. There's Sharon. Take a look at this. This object is 750 miles in diameter. This is a 600 mile wide canyon network. We're not quite sure how that would form on something that's supposed to be frozen. And take a look at this. This may be an impact feature. We don't know. Usually they're round. Why is it angular like that? We don't know yet. There's a close-up on part of this area here, and you can see there's a crater, what appears to be a crater with a mountain sticking out of it. We do see that on the moon and other places, but not quite this way. Usually it's a sharp peak, not just an extended block of ice. And two of the moons close up. They enhance the color on Nix. And on Hydra, it looks like you've got a, a very dark crater here and a number of others. These guys are only, this is only about uh, 12 and a half miles across. This is roughly, if the scale is right, roughly about 8 to 10 miles across. These are fragments, not actual moons as we would consider them to be. So it may be that maybe something happened to kick them off Pluto or Charon. This is how you do it. You have a Kuiper Belt object, comes in, ball of ice, smashes into Pluto, disrupts it. You're allowed debris. There's a debris, debris ring. Most of it falls back to reform Pluto, which explains where you have all this melted material, and it forms Charon. At least that's one idea. 
Okay, the first map was put together on July 8th. Again, this is just reflectance and color map. We don't have everything here, so you can still say there are uh, frozen tigers down here, if you want. Like they used to put on maps, uh, here there'd be, be tigers, here there'd be uh, sea monsters, uh, maybe the Enterprise is here, I don't know. Okay, so we need an update. There's an enlargement of that uh, wonderful stamp. Not yet has been crossed out. It, it has been at least the beginning of exploration. This is Alan Stern over here, who's the principal investigator. He worked 14 years to get this project together. And he's going to be a guest speaker, an honored guest speaker, up at that telescope makers convention I mentioned before. So we're going to need a new stamp. So this is the collectible item. This is the future one, honoring New Horizons, the first spacecraft to explore Pluto in a forever stamp. So that's kind of good. So if you want to find out more about this, about the spacecraft, about the mission, as every week they keep on getting more and more pictures and data, join the adventure. I'll leave this up in a few moments. Go to nasa.gov slash New Horizons, or the better one, to my opinion, Pluto J, uh, J -H -U -A -P -L edu. And if you go to astronomynow.com, you can download at least the first of what they think are going to be globes that you can put together. You can fold the paper together and make your own Pluto globe. And as I always do when I, when I uh, end a talk over here, I thank my wife, Bonnie, uh, who keeps everything spelled properly, centered. If you enjoyed me seeing slides staying in one place, you know, one to the other, that's because Bonnie's uh, help. John Andrews, who conned me, I mean, uh, asked me to give the talk here tonight. Clyde and Patsy Tombaugh. Percival Lowell, and a gentleman I throw in here on this talk because he passed away just before uh, New Horizons starts sending back data. That's Walter Has, who uh, started the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers back in 1947. Uh, that group, yes, Alpo, I, you know, I'll, I'll take the jokes now uh, about the dog food and all that. But it turns out that uh, the ALPO has joined amateur and professional astronomers in observing the planets all these years. And I'm glad at least he lived long enough to know that the spacecraft had made it almost to Pluto space. He passed away earlier this year, so I throw him in there too. Because he got me interested in going for the planets. And that's it. And I thank you for your attention. Now. <laughs>